morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, depending on where you are joining us this day for the launch of the CND proceeding report. Um, my name is Maria Goretti, I'm the African Consultant for International Trial Policy Consortium, and I'm based in Ghana. Um, for today's text, um, kindly permit me to say something briefly about CND. Um, as we all know, it's the main UN decision body on drug issues, and it meets every year for a week in March, where it discusses the global state of drug policy and adopts um, resolutions on the way forward in terms of tackling the global drug situation. Um, the report we are about to launch today is produced every year, and it's one of the most comprehensive analysis of the CND debates available. Um, the report is usually drafted um, through a collaborative effort by the IDPC team and various members of the network. And many thanks to its main author, um, that is uh, Dave Yuli Taylor, who unfortunately could not join us today for this um, very important um, session. The report um, offers us an analysis and overview of the key debates um, that took place this year at the CND. And it also includes um, discussions on the negotiations of each of the resolutions that are usually tabled by member states. Um, so it, um, if, if you look at this year in CND especially, it was quite special because it was the first time that the CND met for its main session in hybrid form. And you can imagine uh, some of the challenges, um, the opportunities, the, the situation offered and how um, this pose for debate. Um, as we launch the report today, I'm really happy to be joined by three civil society representatives who followed um, this year's debate very closely and at least can give us um, more insight into what happened at the commission. So in no particular order, I would like to introduce my panelists. Um, we have Rosine Don. Um, Rosine is the Global Program Coordinator of Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Um, together with um, Zara Snap, who is a co-founder and director of Instituto Ria in Mexico. And last but not the least is Jamie Bridge, who is a chair of the Vienna NGO Committee on Drugs. Um, gentlemen and ladies, thanks so much for making time to join us this afternoon. Um, Rizan, you have actually followed um, this year's um, CND very closely. And I'm sure you have been part of the conversation um, and so what were the key issues at this CND that you think might be interesting to share with um, our, our participants um, during this month? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, yeah, this year's CND was a particularly controversial one, I would say. Uh, every year the CND tends to be like a little dramatic and tentious, but I think this year more than most because it was the uh, anniversary of the International Drug Control Conventions, which are the rules that tell all the countries how what should be illegal and what shouldn't and that sort of thing. Um, and it was both the there's two conventions and it was the 50th and 60th year anniversaries. Um, and this kind of led to this great celebration, I guess, amongst um, all of the member states and the UNODC and all of the uh, institutions within the CND. Um, but it was particularly interesting, I thought at least, because it was following the rescheduling of cannabis, which happened in December for medi recognizing medical benefit. And it was almost as if, at least from my perception, a lot of member states were using the conventions as a way to kind of rail against this uh, major reform or to like underline the importance of the conventions and the prohibitionist policies that surround them. Um, so we saw a lot of kind of um, statements kind of underlining that uh, many countries still perceive cannabis as one of the largest risks um, and that they will not be, you know, loosening regulations and kind of reinforcing this narrative uh, throughout. So that was a really clear um, theme we saw throughout uh, the CND. Um, which was interesting because it felt almost maybe reactionary in some ways to the rescheduling. So we saw quite a lot of that. 
Um, and then the convention um, celebrations in general focused on kind of stating the importance of the conventions and how important and how effective they have been um, over the last 50 years, which, uh, you know, looking at the World Drug Report and other uh, areas may not seem to ring quite as effective as it, uh, they were championing during the opening section. But um, yeah, that was the convention anniversaries. Um, in other areas, we also, as a youth organization, focus very largely on youth representation within the United Nations and particularly within the CND. Um, and oftentimes this focuses on the youth forum, which is a bit of a mystery <laughs> to uh, all youth organizations because there is little to no clarity as to how youth delegates are selected for the youth forum. Member states have like full control over who gets to attend the youth forum. And usually, you know, there is no clarity. We have spoken to delegations where there's they're not sure who the youth delegates are and that sort of thing. We know that some countries do have selection processes, such as Canada, where they have a competition for who gets onto the youth forum, but it's really unclear. And this youth forum in itself, uh, I guess it was different this year because we had the hybrid CND where partially online, but usually within the building, the youth forum happens kind of on the other side of the <laughs> Vienna International Center. And most of the time, the youth delegates don't get to interact with the proceedings of the commission very much. Um, and usually they get to make a statement on the final day, which they did do this year. Um, but we have been told by youth delegates that we know that they don't necessarily have very much input into that statement. So this is something we brought up during the CND. Um, it's something like that concerns us majorly because it feels almost a tokenization of youth uh, to have this youth forum with little to no power within the space um, with no clarity as to who is being put onto it. We also know that uh, many youth delegates aren't even aware. We know that uh, there was one country's youth delegation that didn't even know that the youth forum was occurring this year uh, because they were never notified about it. And um, that seems to be kind of typical in this space. So there was a uh, definite issues of the representation of youth. And the reason this like, you know, bothers uh, youth civil society organizations so much is because it's so often that we see resolutions or narratives that focus around uh, protecting youth and young people with little to no input from youth or young people. And oftentimes little to no research on how young people use drugs or interact with drugs in their environments. So. That was particularly uh, contentious this year and we brought it up. We did get some responses from the chair of the CND, but it was uh, pretty much focusing on how it's up to the member states and, uh, you know, there's not really much to be seen in that area, but we're hoping we will be fighting for it more every year and trying to hold countries accountable to who they put on those delegations. Um, so yeah, that was a really big section for us. Um, we also saw for the first time ever the United States um, mentioning their support for harm reduction in their opening statements. And that was a radically new position for the United States who generally have stayed kind of quiet or on a more conservative side of the CND, at least in my experience. Um, and to see them come out, recognize harm reduction and also uh, racial equity, I believe as well, um, was a uh, complete uh, change of tune really like they had never been against it but they had never really voiced their support in this way before so that was very significant um, and we're hoping that this might mean a little bit more kind of backbone to the countries that support harm reduction in the future when we're going into like resolutions and stuff like that um, otherwise in terms of key themes uh, the common position was kind of absent or <laughs> missing in uh, many different ways throughout the CND um which was concerning to us and then yeah in, in regards to legal regulation um it there wasn't much um i could see i might have missed it <laughs> unfortunately but um, there wasn't much to be spoken about in terms of like the legal regulation of cannabis there seems to be much more of a anti um cannabis and doing everything that they can to disregard it we also saw this like during the um World Drug Report this year that was re recently released, there was like very little recognition of legal or regulated markets of any types of drugs, even like decriminalized cultivation and that sort of thing as well. And um, we also have a 
just released um, as SSDP with uh, Youth Rise, our uh, Youth Response to the World Drug Report, which we'll be holding. Uh, you can find out everything that you want to know about what young people think of global drug trends, how the World Drug Report reflects the realities of our situations, and what policy uh, ramifications we would like to see. We'll be holding an event tomorrow at 5 p.m. Vienna time, so it's Central European time, um, which I think Juan will put in the chat on Facebook somewhere, but uh, you can come and join us. You can also read the response at that link. So yeah, I think that's all I've got for now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. And that's really insightful to hear about some of the things that happen at the PND, especially you talked about the fact that um, there were some resolutions that brought it around you. And, and you always wonder when countries take the floor to speak about you, um, you will hardly even see the youth themselves being represented and speaking for themselves. And, and that is a little bit disturbing that at the CND, the seat of where all these discussions are taking place, the youth are not given a good representation. But we hope that maybe as much as possible with the work you and your team are doing with youth, we will be able to get that forum where the youth will be truly represented and speak for their own issues. Thank you so much, Rosen. Um, so um, we saw that this year also um, had a number of resolutions that came up and we did have quite a number of them that were tabled by countries as usual, um, very controversial ones, of course. Um, to Zara, what can you tell us about this year's um, resolutions that were tabled by many, some of the countries? Yeah, thank you, Maria. And Grayson, let me right there with with um, some of the contentious issues, because we saw those reflected in what is known as the Committee of the Whole, which is where these resolutions are debated and, and negotiated. Um, and really, it's important to know about the, and, and it's known as the cow. So I'm going to talk about the cow, and people will wonder why am I talking about cows. But um, so, so this is the space where literally uh, they put up a Word document and then using track changes negotiate what are the words that should be allowed in these resolutions. And since these resolutions are passed by consensus, they are often watered down to the most, to the lowest common denominator. Everyone has to be on board or you throw them out the window. And, and most of the time, and Jamie is, is really the expert on having followed these uh, well and, and others from, from TNI who, who just sit in the cow during the entire week and really are able to watch as the language um, maybe began in one sense and changes completely. And we actually have different um, examples this year of both ones where it got much worse versus also a resolution where the language got much better. And so um, as, as, as we were talking, it was five resolutions this year. The, um, they starting with, they, they named them L2 to L6. Um, and L2 was really about COVID and how the impact of COVID on uh, drug markets and connecting it to the high level forum, a uh, political forum on sustainable development, which was happening. The thing is that they also tend to, in these resolutions, when they can't come up with an agreement on language, they just go back to agreed language from other resolutions. So they just pull up what's already been uh, agreed in order not to have a fight. The other thing that's important to know about these resolutions is that much of the negotiations happens in informal meetings in which most of the informal meetings, civil society does not have a way to listen in unless you've been invited to be part of the official delegation, which I've been able to in the past as part of Mexico, Canada has opened it up, New Zealand has often had a few uh, civil society representatives on their official delegation. But those informals this year happened solely online which made it even harder and we weren't in those spaces. So it was harder to, to be part of, or at least be reporting back on what was happening in those informal negotiations and the evolution of some of these, um, some of these resolutions. And really I would build on what, um, what, what was said before and that we're seeing a deep polarization in the world where it's very clear that there are countries that are moving forward with progressive language on a national level, and they're trying to take that to the CND. So we saw the, the biggest debate on the floor in the cow around L3, which was on, 
I can give you guys the full title, which was long, the, the final title, no? Um, facilitating Access to Comprehensive Sci Scientific Evidence-Based Drug Demand Reduction Services and Related Measures, including for people impacted by social marginalization. This title was changed because they had a whole long conversation about what social marginalization even means and whether they should go back to just using vulnerable rather than marginalized. And this was, this was, um, this was proposed, this resolution was brought forward by Canada, who in the past was trying to build on resolutions they had proposed around stigma towards people who use drugs. And so they are really with this, within this government trying to push forward and, and just nudge, you know, nudge these, these small uh, semantic changes, but that are very important on a broader level. And so we saw two groups really come down on social marginalization and what that means, no? And it was Canada, Mexico, Portugal, Uruguay, the US, New Zealand, Argentina, Guatemala in one side being the progressive force and then you saw on another side, Russia, Turkey, Iran, uh, Egypt, Japan, Singapore saying, no, 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 we can't have that kind of language. And even, you know, for example, the Turkish delegate saying, I'm a woman, I shouldn't be on that list. I don't feel like I've been marginalized. Um, and even getting to a point where delegates were saying, you know, we are actively marginalizing people in this discussion and the language that's coming out because we're pushing, we're, we aren't naming it, we're marginalizing them. And so it came down to a really, um, an ideological sense of that this is, we are being, we are in a polarized situation and it's hard to come to consensus when you have countries that have such different drug policies or such different perspectives towards how do you put people at the center? or we don't wanna have anyone at the center, you know, and we want to just kind of continue with our, with our ongoing uh, drug policies around prohibition. I mean, we think about Iran, think about, they have harm reduction. So then, then we had other resolutions, and this is where, what I wanted to go into, where you had strange stakeholders that were on the same side. Um, so in the resolution, which was L5 on treatment and essential services, um, we saw something, and, and I really would recommend that you all read the report because for those of us who are a little bit nerdy, and I think probably if you're watching this, you fit into that category, it's, 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 it's fascinating to see how these conversations are happening if you weren't able to follow along at, if it was maybe outside of your time frame, um, because many of these discussions were at five in the morning. But so the L5 was around how do we promote scientific evidence-based quality, affordable and comprehensive drug prevention, treatment, sustained recovery and related support services. And this was pushed by Portugal. They were also trying to push something progressive. You know, they were taking a risk um, on behalf of the European Union. And, and one of the things that they found was difficult to push forward was these was the term essential services, that these would be considered essential services. And for example, the US was against that. And probably has to do with domestic policies that they don't have insurance for everyone. They don't have essential health services that, that expand everyone. And oftentimes in resolutions, what they do is they just add something that says, you know, as national legislation ap applies as a means to create these caveats. Um, and so what they eventually got to was this term essential healthcare systems instead of services systems and so it's these tiny changes that that diplomats are having to negotiate because even though these resolutions in a way aren't super binding on a national level and and it's not like you take it back and now you have to follow everything the resolution says people from civil society other institutions in the government are going to be using that as a means to say hey you signed up to this so let's see how you can follow through um, and that and that's how we can we as civil society can use resolutions to really push um, the different you know the different uh, strategies that we think would would be better and so this is where we've seen um, some of these some of these polarizations, but also where strange bedfellows start working together because it was um, the other thing in the in that one in that resolution was around torture, you know, and, and really talking about torture in a resolution, which is something that hadn't happened before. And the US 
and Egypt were very against even moving forward with conversations about torture, whereas then, you know, the UK, Argentina, and Canada wanted to have that language. And so that's where you see this, these, these kind of um, these contentious and controversial issues coming up. And the last, um, well, the last two things I just want to mention is there's also a resolution that happens every year, which is on behalf of Thailand, Germany, and Peru, and that's about alternative development. You know, they had a few changes, which in the report you can kind of see, but, but it's interesting because for more than 10 years, they've been proposing basically the same resolution. And so we're seeing this, this ongoing shift, slow shift in language where they bring in, you know, this time it was that they brought in a gender perspective and they were able to have consensus on that language. And so it's like slow, but that's, those are three countries that are very committed to alternative development and Germany funding much of the work around alternative development in the world. Um, and we can have our critiques of that and a whole another uh, webinar on that. And the last one I wanna say is, you know, there, there, was a, there was a resolution on, the, which was essentially trying to schedule by resolution because in years past, they hadn't been able to schedule a substance known as tramadol, which is a synthetic opioid. Um, and so Nigeria and Egypt moved forward uh, with, with that. They, they proposed that resolution um, in the beginning and it went through substantial, and they were essentially trying to schedule it in a resolution without, because the WHO has not recommended scheduling tramadol, which would be the, the uh, legitimate process in order to schedule. And that's where then I just want to hats off to, to IDPC because I know that they did a lot and TNI that they did a lot of work on ensuring that that wouldn't happen and that the language actually became much softer and positive uh, pieces were introduced around, um, were, were introduced around, uh, you know, how do we make sure that actually this has references to the availability and access of substances for medical and scientific purposes around, you know, pain relief and suffering since tramadol, even though it can be abused in some contexts, it's often one of the only painkillers that's available in so many countries um, where you, because it's not internationally scheduled. And so that's where we see, you know, resolutions can be used for political purposes, which is what they were trying to do there. And in this case, there was enough pushback that that wasn't able to be, um, that wasn't be able to be used. And then the, the final thing, and just Rosen had, had chatted, had mentioned it, and Jamie can probably talk about it too. Contentious issue was the UN, um, the, the, the common position and how to refer to the common position. And there were a few instances where they did go back to UNGAS language. Um, if we remember from 2016, the United Nations General Assembly Special Session on Drugs, which for us is always a positive thing because for us, that's a real document that we should be turning and looking to because it was approved and passed in the General Assembly. And so it has greater uh, coherence and greater acceptance from our from our perspective as civil society, progressive civil reform uh, movement, civil society. And so I always think that the cow is a fascinating place to watch how the world is changing. And we saw the US changing its position on some things, but then on the other hand, for example, torture not into that and not into recognizing that they actually don't provide uh, treatment as an essential service to all of the people who, who live in that country. And, and so we really are seeing this polarization and I actually, um, celebrate the polarization because I think it's it's definitely opening the door to new language and it was hard to get to a final consensus on um, Friday evening of the CND. They got it because they watered it down and Canada, for example, had to step back on their social marginalization. They said, you know what, if paragraphs are not accepted, we'll let it go. And that's something we've seen. Russia, Turkey, Iran, they're very good at standing their ground. And sometimes our side in quotations does seeds more because we do want to get to a final resolution and so yeah just keep watching the cow because it is it is interesting thanks thanks so much zara um it's really interesting to hear a lot about the discussions in the cow and resolutions and the critical role resolutions play especially in terms of negotiations and all that and um, um thanks so much for emphasizing the importance of civil society in all these discussions, especially when it comes to resolutions, negotiations at that level. Um, so um, that means that civil society plays a very critical role in this discussion. Uh, so now my question goes to Jamie. Um, civil society over the years have played 
a very critical role when it comes to the debate at the CNB. And that has been highlighted by the two speakers, Rudin and uh, Zara. Um, and so there is no doubt that um, civil society plays a very critical role in this space. Um, there were a lot of concerns over civil society participation at this year's um, first ever virtual CMB. How did it go? And as a chair of the, uh, a very big platform or civil society forum, what do you have to say and how did things go at the end? Thanks, Maria. Yeah, so um, I, I, I work, as, as you may know, I work with the International Drug Policy Consortium, but I'm, I'm very much speaking today as chair of the Vienna NGO committee, which is the main platform in Vienna that links civil society with the UN and with the CND. So obviously we there were a lot of concerns, as you say, Maria, a lot of concerns about civil society access. And that was partly because we'd seen over the year, you know, with the pandemic and with the, the limits on physical travel, we had seen civil society spaces being shut down across the United Nations. You know, there were meetings happening where NGOs weren't allowed to attend or, or their, their participation was very limited. So we kind of came into the CND very nervous about what it would look like, but also because just before the CND, so, so this year the CND was in April, which is a bit later than usual. And the reason for that is in March, there was a major UN meeting on drugs, the, uh, sorry, on crime, the Crime Congress, which was, again, held entirely online uh, due to the pandemic. Um, and because that took place in March, it meant that we got to about a month before the CND was meant to start. And we still really didn't know a lot of details about how were we gonna access, what link did we click, how do we register, all these kind of details. So in the absence of that information, I think anxieties grew. Um, and that led the Vienna NGO committee to, to write an open letter um, mainly to the, to, you, to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime and to the, the CND Secretariat, which basically laid out what we hoped would happen at the CND. And really what we were saying is that the level that civil society has in terms of our engagement, it really should be no different in an online meeting than it is in a physical meeting. That really was what we were aiming for. And I think now that the dust has settled, now that you know we're a few months away from it, I think we can look back on it and say that actually the level of civil society access was probably as good as we could have hoped for. You know, I think it generally worked very well. We had um, UNODC, they, they chose a new platform, and, uh, it was called Interprefy. And I think there was around a thousand places on this platform in total, because all UN meetings have to be provided in the six official UN languages. So this was the platform to do that. And of those a thousand place, of those one thousand places, civil society was given uh, around 150 to 170. So we were given a decent share, which is a bit less than the numbers of civil society that you'd normally have at a CND in person but was a lot more, to be honest, than, than we were expecting. So crucially, it was enough to meet the demand. So every ECOSOC registered NGO was invited to apply for spaces and everyone was given spaces at the meeting who wanted it. So that was really important for me as chair, but for the committee generally, that everyone who wanted to participate was able to. And those people who were on the platform, they were then able to, to make interventions. Um, they were able to, to kind of chat with other participants and to see who else was in the meetings. They could follow all the meetings. And then they could also observe the Committee of the Whole, the COW that Zara talked about, um, which, as Zara said, is such a, such a fascinating, important part of this meeting. Civil society, we're not allowed to intervene in that space. We're not allowed to say anything. We are only ever observers. Even when we're physically there, we just sit at the back of the room and kind of keep quiet and watch what's going on. Um, but uh, we were able to do that again, which again was really important for us at the BNGOC. Um, in the end, we were able to secure speakers in every agenda item, and we were able to fill all the speaking slots that we had available. And we had more than 100, I think it might have been 110 side events taking place and all the side events were online this year which has pros and cons but I think the the major pro 
was that it allowed anybody to access that side of it. You don't, ha you didn't have to be registered for the meeting. You could just follow the link and and join that side of it. So some of those side events were attended by hundreds of uh, of participants, which was really good, really promising to see. So I think overall, we were happy with with how how it went. It was the first ever CND to happen entirely online. Um, there was always going to be some technical issues. There was always going to be some challenges, of course. You know, that that's that's just the nature of, of the online world. Um, but I think we were really pleased with how it went. And, and I really must um, emphasize that credit really should go to UNODC and particularly to the CND Secretariat for taking our concerns on board and, and for facilitating the access as well as they did. They, again, you know, they had a series of very big meetings to organise and to shift to online platforms in a relatively short space of time. So they did, I really do believe they did um, a, a good job in terms of uh, access. And if you, if you read the CND Proceedings Report, there's a lot of content in there that talks about the, the difference that an online meeting made. Zara's touched upon the main part, which was the negotiations. The negotiations are always tense and they're always complicated, but the fact that they were happening on Zoom made it even harder to, to reach that agreement. You know, if you're there in person, you can take someone out for a coffee and just kind of negotiate with them, um, you know, one-to-one, uh, -one. but you can't do that if you're all on Zoom or on Interprefy or something like this. So um, that was definitely one important factor. And I think looking, looking forward, you know, I think what, what we've got to focus on now is I hope that when we come to the next CND, which I think will be in March 2022, um, I hope when we get to that stage that in-person participation will be possible. You know, I, I'm certainly hoping to, to get to Vienna. It's been a long time and I know our colleagues who are based in Vienna, like Machine, would, would like to have us all around again for, for a week. Um, but so I'm really hoping that, on, that in-person participation is possible again. But I think there's some elements of an online CND that we really should keep. And I think there's now no real reason not to have them. So for example, every session was webcast. And that's really important because um, that's really important because it means that even if you're not one of the registered participants, you can still follow what's going on. Yeah. Except for the cow. The cow wasn't. Except for the cow. That yeah, was something I had in my notes and I hadn't said. So I'm yeah. Glad. Yeah, no, the cow wasn't because it's classed as a slightly more closed meeting, which, yeah, was a bit unfortunate. But but every every plenary session. But we can work on that. That's something yeah, we can yeah. work towards, you know. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. That would be lovely to see. And then the other thing to work towards is, and this is you know particularly relevant for Zara and, and colleagues in the Americas, um, if it's being webcast, it wasn't being recorded, and there's there's really no reason why if you're webcasting an event, you should be able to record it because if you record it that then means that you can follow it uh, at a later time. So for example, as Zara mentioned, but a lot of the sessions were at three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning. Two to five in the morning. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's, and then like, so you either had a midnight to, yeah, it was tough. Yeah, yeah so uh, recording the session. because she made it to everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, huge kudos to those who, uh, who stayed up, but having it recorded would, would allow people to participate from other time zones as well. So I think there's definitely things to improve, but crucially, I think there's a lot that we can learn from this year and that we can carry on. And I think even with the side events, you know, it, it's got to be good to have a conversation about can we, can the side events still be available online so that anyone can watch them, not just the people who are there in Vienna. So there's lots of discussion to be had uh, to try and to try and build on this for 2022 and, and beyond. I mean, I like I say, I do hope we are able to get face to face, uh, at least some of us to get face to face next year, because I do think that even with the greatest platform in the world, um, you can never quite replicate the advocacy power of physically being there and being able to talk to people in the corridors and, and, and that kind of thing. So I do think that's important to get back to at some point, but and, you know, to, to, over, to use an overused phrase about this build back better, I think that's what we should be looking for for CND and, uh, and creating a new hybrid platform that really has the best of both worlds. Thank you very much, Jamie, for this. And I have been listening to a number of civil society representatives, especially 
in the um, um, African region who actually um, commented um, the civil society group in terms of how they were able to mobilize other civil society groups to be able to join the online sessions. It, it more or less was like CND brought to the doorsteps of many who could not travel to uh, Vienna to participate in this. And so going yeah. forward, I would like to see even when we have in-person meetings, we should still be able to webcast this so that people who cannot travel physically to Vienna will be able to still follow these discussions and, and at least participate in the process um, as it would have been if you were present. Um, yeah, I mean, I one thing we were able to do, Maria, just to add to that, one thing we were, the Vienna NGO committee, because we weren't spending any money on travel, we were able, we put out an open call and we were able to support local groups to hold like watching parties um, and to, you know, to bring people together. And, and we did a survey after the CND to see how people, you know, what people's reactions were to an online CND. And um, around two thirds of the participants actually said that the fact that CND was online improved their participation. So there's a lot of people who would never normally have attended a CND who this year were able to. And I think that's something we definitely have to, to put in place for that that carries on. Thank you so much, Jimmy, for emphasizing on that issue. Um, I know we are a little bit behind time, but I can't thank you all so much for what you have done this afternoon. Within 30 minutes, you actually brought the entire proceedings of CNV and discussed it within 30 minutes. And I'm sure people who are watching and listening to us would have appreciated how the proceedings went, some of the gains, some of the challenges, and, and the way forward, how we can address a lot of these challenges to make things much better. Um, on that note, I wish to thank you all. I appreciate you all for making time to join us for this important discussion. And to our viewers, um, the link to the report is being posted on the IDPC website. Kindly make time to read it. It's a very important um, uh, report that summarizes a lot of the issues that my colleagues here have highlighted in this 30 minutes discussion. Once again, thank you very much, Zara, Rosin, and Jamie for joining us for this discussion. I wish you a lovely day. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. All right. Bye. Thank you, Maria.